All right, today we're talking about love one another in this series. Today, specifically, love your neighbor and love your enemies. It's together. And I'll explain that in a moment, why loving your neighbor and loving your enemies is the same people. All right. This is going to be a good day. Who's ready? Let Jesus make it a great day. Let God, let this be God, the best day ever we've had in church, receiving from you. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I want your hearts open. John 13, Sonia's going to read. John 13, verses 18 to 35. Take your Bibles out and look at this long text today. If you were on Facebook Live this past week with me, there was uh, Jed Gorham from Eau Claire EMC shared about reading big text of scripture. And I know a few of you here go, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So today, get ready for a big text of scripture. John 18, sorry, 13, 18 to 35. Good morning. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned him to ask, Who's he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, It is the one to whom I give the, give the bread and I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, the son of Iscariot. When Jesus had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. A new commandment. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of, uh, because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer, and as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's amazing when you read all of that scripture in the context where Jesus is with his disciples, the betrayer Judas in their midst, and then he goes on to explain this great new commandment about loving one another. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors often, many times it's mentioned, and also to love our enemies probably because our neighbor and our enemy are generally the same people. I want to give you good news. We have some neighbors around us that we love dearly, absolutely love dearly, and God is with us in communicating that love to our neighbors. God is helping us to love our neighbors in our new neighborhood. And I will tell you, victory is we've got some awesome neighbors. And it wasn't always that way when we first came. In fact, maybe we were the weird ones and everybody was ch checking us out. But after a while... They're kind of normal, and maybe people opened up their hearts to us, waving hello. And I just received, was it 32 eggs? 32 eggs, like as a gift for me, just pulling in the recycling bins and bringing it to the garage door. And I'm going, I like this neighborhood. I'm going to be a recycle bin collector all the time. <laughs> Things are happening. 
People across the street honking, people are waving, kids are doing stuff. I'm telling you, our neighborhood is an awesome place. Can you say that about your neighborhood? Do you love where you live? Do you like your building? Where are the fallow field place people? Are they around here? I, yeah, there's a bunch of them. I think, you know, up in Standard, there's Bethany Corner. Well, I think the Bethany Corner in Kitchener is fallow field place because there's so many of you that live in that area. But anyways, how many people know our neighborhoods are to be loved by us? God placed us there. Our church is in a great neighborhood, and we're called to love this neighborhood. And we're called to love those in our neighborhood all the way around us. God's also called you as the church to love your neighbors. Can I have an amen even before I get going on this message? Amen. All right. Now, when we demonize or when we dehumanize someone that we disagree with or actively work against them, we're actually working against the kingdom of God. God isn't asking us to agree on everything. In fact, you probably don't agree with your spouse on everything. You probably don't even agree with yourself on everything. How many people you've changed your mind over yourself? For, oh yeah, I had an idea and then thought, man, was I ever being dumb and changed your mind? How many people think that's a good thing? Yes, just Tim's the only honest person in the house, but that's okay. If you're not changing your mind often, you're probably not really paying attention. Because I think the only way to grow is to change. True? And so when we look at this, the God doesn't need us to, act, to agree with everyone. But the important thing is that we agree on at least one really important idea. And this is this. God is commanding us to agree on this idea. That whenever we meet a perceived enemy, whether it be our next door neighbor or somebody at your work, or one of those relatives, a perceived neighbor, or somebody that's online posting on things on Facebook that makes your blood boil, we'll just leave it right there, online or face-to-face, -face, we immediately think, this is the key, God loves that person even if I don't like them. That person is loved of God, a beloved person of God, created in the image and likeness of God, and God loves them. God's given everything for this person to know him. God has given Jesus Christ for this person. When Jesus went to the cross, he was demonstrating his love. How many people know? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. True? How many were grateful that he died on the cross for you? Guess what? He died on the cross for your enemies, too. He died on the cross for the people you don't like. He died on the cross, or even that uncle that's like, eh, it's crazy uncle, you know, we all have them. You all have a crazy uncle, right? No? Okay, if you don't know who your crazy uncle is, you're probably the crazy uncle, just saying right now. <laughs> just. But God loves them. God loves our enemies, and we should love our enemies too. In this text, we see Judas. Judas' presence at the Last Supper tells us that even those who betray us, even the one that betrayed God was still welcome at God's table. Is your table long enough to seat your enemies? Even in the presence of my enemies, my cup runneth over. You wonder about those enemies. Are they like in a distant distance? Maybe they're actually at your table. Maybe God wants to bless you and anoint you, fill you with his spirit to be actually a person that spreads the table. What we need are longer tables in the kingdom of God. Would you agree with me? All right, that was my intro. Point number one that I want to talk about. In fact, I'm going to step on toes today. Just mind, I warn you, hope you brought your steel toes because I have got some things I have to say to church today. Are you ready for this? Number one, don't be indifferent to people. Eli Weisel has this incredible quote. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. The politics of heaven is summed up in 40 words. You can count them if you want. Trust me, there's 40 here. Love your enemies. Do, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Turn the other cheek. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies, for emphasis. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Who counted? There's 40. In the times of crisis and despair, Christianity should sound like, my heart is breaking with yours. Christianity should sound like, I'm grieving with you. 
Can I bring you a meal? Is there something that I can do for you? Christianity should sound like we're going to get through this together. Actually, weeping with those who weep and mourning with those who mourn. My son sent me a TikTok video this week. I don't know if you saw this little boy in Ukraine crossing the Ukraine-Poland border. Broke my heart by himself with a bag of toys and a phone number in his hand. That's all he had. I don't know where his parents, family are. When I saw that little boy wailing, weeping, mourning, the, who knows, God knows the calamity that he's, he's endured. If you don't feel something when you are presented with something of great sadness or sorrow and, and your heart's not moved like I talked about last week, if your innermost being is not grieved, then I wonder you could check yourself if you've got a pulse. Because we should, especially as believers in Jesus, be deeply moved by these things. Let me tell you about Jesus. When Lazarus died, Jesus didn't respond to the family and the people around with empty platitudes or reasons why they should be strong and get over it. No, what did Jesus do? Jesus, shortest Bible verse. You should memorize this. Jesus wept. Two words. How many people you can put that to memory? It's there more than once in the Bible, by the way. So there's three different occasions where Jesus weeps. Lazarus' tomb. Remember when he looks over the city of Jerusalem and he wept because they were sheep without his shepherd. They were leaderless. Jesus is, gets, is deeply moved by people who are not cared for spiritually well. And there are many people in this day who are and I'll say the shepherdless. They might have the great shepherd, but they're on their own trying to serve the Lord. Our hearts should be moved for those who once were in fellowship in, in communities of faith who have now gone astray or left the way or are sitting home alone. And I hope if some of you are online, one day we see your beautiful face because we want to hug that neck. We want to give you a high five. We want to tell you we love you face to face. Even though I say it over line, there's nothing like telling somebody you love them face to face. Amen? Amen. Yesterday was incredible. I was sitting at the table with all those wonderful... If you were here and you were sitting on my table eating meals with me, yes, you folks, wonderful folks there. There's many of you that were there. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what you look like. This is This is real. And I miss that. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm missing that connection. But everyone actually is missing that connection. And can I tell you, in a, especially in a culture where everything is high tech, we need a lot more high touch as the body of Christ. So when we look at Jesus responding when he wept, it doesn't sound like, oh, everything happens for a reason. The platitudes, the one-liners that we give people who are either going through a difficult time, who are grieving, or actually are probably struggling with their faith in some idea and say, hey, you need to get over it. Buck up, buttercup. All the things that we might want to say, keep them in your head. Don't, don't let them come out of your mouth. How about we put a guard over our mouths and remember that whatever we share, we share to edify that salt that is, that is actually good for somebody else. How many people, if you're struggling, you don't need somebody to tell you, hey, get over it. I remember growing up, occasionally it was very appropriate for my father to say, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Get out of here. Come up. And my dad would come up. Huh. And he'd give me the old, that clap and the hut. Huh. And I knew right away, I need to get over it. How many people know sometimes fathers need to speak into lives of sons and daughters and say, all right, enough of the pity party. Let's move it along. But how many people realize that as brothers and sisters, my brother never said to me, my brothers never said, hey, come on, get over it. Huh, yeah. No, they would never try to imitate my father. They'd be there for me if I'm going through a hard time. I remember my brother Kevin. He was on the, we we're playing king of the hill, king of the snow hill. My brother Kevin was on the top, and I was on another hill, and us doze bros, we were kind of like taking territory. And like, I would knock down the people off that hill, he would knock down, and all of a sudden, my brother got ganged up upon, and they were laughing at mock, and they are starting to beat him up on top of, this is that St. Mike's Catholic School. Can you imagine that? Nice little Catholic kids fighting on the snow hills. 
And I remember all I heard was my brother Kev say, F, that's it, A-N-T-H. And I knew exactly, to the rescue. And both of us, we'd be pummeling everybody around. I was given nickname Boots for a reason, not just because I could stop being a good goalie in road hockey. I'll just leave it right there. That's all I'm going to say. We shouldn't be just telling everything happens for a reason. It's all part of God's will. God's in control. Don't worry. You're okay. Get over it. How many people know that actually is demoralizing? It doesn't demonstrate love. Phrases like that actually minimize people's suffering, adds more pain to their present circumstances, and really isn't a demonstration of love. So don't be indifferent to people. Let's care for one another. May we as Christians be filled with compassion like Jesus was. He mourned out of compassion for them. Point number two. If I didn't step on your toes there, get ready. Number two, listen first before you judge. Just everybody together, we're going to just go, we agree with that. Right off before I even share, just say, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, pastor. Amen. So be it. Whatever you want to say, just acknowledge this is a really good point. Because by the time I'm at the end of this point, you might not think that's a good idea. <laughs> it's hard to be judgmental when you're trying to listen with compassion, with honesty, with sincerity, and with fairness. Look at the scripture in James 1, verse 19. It says, everyone should be quick to listen. In fact, read this with me. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Notice the two things we need to be slow on. What do we need to be quick on? And what's mentioned first? How about we listen before we speak? And if there's reason to be upset later, sure. But how many times do we not listen and we're upset already before we even listen? How many times do we speak before we listen? This is a great scripture. Listen before you judge. One time the Pharisees were trying to judge Jesus without letting him have a say or explain himself. They didn't want to hear his side of the story, but Nicodemus, you remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3? We don't, that's not the only time he shows up, the one that wants to know how to be born again. Later on in John chapter 7, verse 51, look at this. Nicodemus is speaking, and he speaks up. One of the Pharisees, he says, according to our law, we cannot condemn people before hearing them and finding out what they have done. It's great advice. I'm going to read that again. According to our law, we cannot condemn people before hearing them and finding out what they have done, as the Pharisees love to do. How many times have you judged a person or someone, your child, your spouse? I have. Your neighbor? I have. I labeled my one neighbor. Mm, hope they're not online today. That's a cranky one. How many people have judged people that were very different than you and maybe even opposed some ideas that you had were maybe even considered sort of like a social enemy to you and then all of a sudden when you got to know them you became really good friends i've confessed this before i think it was way before i actually was here present was online that i that i that i was a bit of a racist racist when i was a kid i you know maybe no fault to my own but there was, there was nobody from different ethnic origins around us. We were, we were just a bunch of farm kids, a bunch of Dutch kids, and, you know, the neighbors were Dutch, and everybody around that whole area of south, south of Woodstock, we were all kind of the same. And how people know that sometimes you can judge people by their outer appearance? Not that we didn't like them, we just didn't know much about them. And it wasn't until... I purposely began to engage in conversation, and I'll tell you this amazing, when I went to Circle Square Ranch, I was 18 years old, and there was people there from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds that were working on stuff. It was like an eye-opening, wow! I liked their food, for sure. And then I was, like, amazed at how, how amazing they really were. In fact, one of them, and you know him, Robin Mishanda, he was the one that taught me how to shave with a blade. I used the and he used, oh, that's, that's, a, that's no good. You got to use a blade. And he taught me how to blade and shave. It was like, and he was like my big brother to me. And Robin's from India. And I tell you, I, my, my heart and his heart, just he became a best man in, in our wedding. And like, I love Robin so much. But I, 
had no idea. I judged him without knowing him. And now he's my best friend, outside my wife, obviously. Incredible how God can change your heart and how he can work in your heart. Um, I'm telling you right now, how many times have you judged someone without listening to their story first, without realizing what they're going through? You judge, oh, man, why are they, you know, they're always sad, they're always this, or whatever label you might want to put on. Have you ever found yourself treating some way the Pharisees treated Jesus? When you feel the urge to judge someone, let me give you some practical advice. Stop and take a breath. In fact, hold that breath if you need to. You're about to... <gasps> it's a really good practice if you can hold your breath before you speak from your mouth. It helps you kind of pause before you make a judgment. If that's what it takes for you to listen before you speak, then hold your breath. Let's just practice together. We're just going to take a deep breath. <gasps> hold it as long as you want. Do you think some things need to come to light in someone's life? And you need to feel like you're, you're, you've been appointed and anointed to tell them, straighten them out. You feel that kind of feeling? It's like, all right, they're an idiot. I'm going to tell them. Yep, I'm going to do that. I remember in counseling one time. I think I've shared this story. There was a couple there. They were having all kinds of problems. And I told, I said to Honey, it was like, I was about to say something out of my mouth that I think would have regretted. Because I was thinking, the guy's an idiot. I'm going to tell him. I know the problem in this marriage. You married an idiot. That's what I was going to tell her. But I was like, oh, no, inside voice, inside voice. Keep it to myself. How many times we judge people and we don't know their story and get to know this story? Sonia is exactly who the person I'm thinking of. It's like, oh my gosh, they've had it. all kinds of trauma in their childhood, and there's all kinds of brokenness, and they really need Jesus. God, help us to take a deep breath. It's probably not your job to expose things in people's lives, by the way. It's probably not your job. Let God take care of it. Now, if you're in an abusive situation, or you're being abused in any kind of way whatsoever, uh, you need to tell somebody especially as difficult as it may be, even in your own home. You need to talk to somebody that you trust. You need to share that confidence with somebody that you know cares about you. Because if you're in an abusive situation, uh, you might need to be the one to expose it. You ever hear what I'm saying? You probably are the one that needs to expose it. We pray, Father, for great courage, if that is anybody online here in this place. Give them the courage bring that to light but listen to me even though god will take care of you your job is to listen first try to understand people stop judging people that's some of the struggle look what matthew chapter 7 jesus said this verses 1 and 2 basically really clear it doesn't get much simpler than that do not judge everybody say those three words with me do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way you judge others you will be judged we reap what you sow when it comes to judgment in other words and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you, measured to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So listen in love and let God be the judge. Point number three. Respond to unfairness with love. Unfairness is part of the human condition. Oh, that's not fair. Welcome to Life 101. This is the reality. You can't live on this earth for very long without feeling like you're going through something that's completely unfair, that people treated you unfairly. Maybe it's a parent who put you through some things that was very unfair, that made actually your childhood very miserable. Maybe it's an employer. I don't know if you've been in a situation where your boss treats you unfairly. They're harsh with you. They're, they're mean. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of situation. Uh, they're meaner to you than they treat their coworkers. It feels like that's really unfair. Maybe you feel like you were handled unjustly by the legal process. Maybe there's things that happened to you and the legal system failed you or treated you unfairly how you felt you needed to be treated. I don't know, I'm not going to ask for hands, but I'm sure that, that happens to people. You can choose to respond to the people who hurt you by hurting them back. 
enough. I'll say that again. You can choose to respond to people that hurt you by hurting them back. But can I tell you that's bad advice? You can, not a good idea, but if you feel that you want to, I mean, it's your choice, but I'll tell you right now, that's not a good path forward. It's the easiest choice to make to hurt somebody that hurt you, to be mean to somebody that's been mean to you, to treat somebody unfairly if they've treated you unfairly. Can I tell you, you'd even feel justified in that. I have every right to feel like this, and I'm going to blah, 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 Charlie Brown's teacher. The reality is, God gives us an option in his word, another option that is the way for those who are followers of Jesus to respond. I told you this wouldn't be an easy message today. If we're going to love one another, we're going to love our neighbors, love our enemies well. Here's the other option, Matthew 5, verse 43 to 44. I'd like you to see it in your Bible. Matthew 5, 43 to 44. This starts off, for those who know New Testament, Jesus says this a lot. You've heard it said, but I say unto you, this translation, everybody says it this way, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the worldly, vis worldly wisdom. Like I said, if you want to, you can hate your enemy all you want. Love your neighbor, love people who love you, and hate people who hate you. But watch what Jesus says. Four words here. But I tell you. Everybody, when Jesus says, but I tell you, watch this. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's a tough, tough scripture. How many would agree with me? And if you don't agree with me, you never been placed that situation where people are persecuting you. Because that's tough. I owned a baseball bat once. I had a few baseball bats, but one in specific in mind. I'm going to share the story, honey, not the details. And uh, she's nervous, I can tell. The, base <laughs> oh, the baseball bat story. So I had a black marker, and I had a baseball bat. And on the baseball bat, I drew a target with that black marker, like a you know target with the rings. And then I had a little arrow with a saying on here, Place knows here. <laughs> there was a point in my life where I was really, really mad at somebody. They treated me unfairly. Like, that's an understatement. And I thought the best, my flesh was like, where's my baseball bat? I, you might not literally have a baseball bat, and you might not necessarily want to whack somebody right in the nose with a baseball bat. How many people know that's pretty fleshy? And I was saved. <laughs> this is not some carnal heathen idiot. This is a carnal heathen Christian idiot. <laughs> How many people, sometimes things happen to you, and your flesh takes over, and your spirit, man, and the Bible, and the knowledge of the Word of God, like, where is it? It's in a fog somewhere. When your flesh rules you in moments of injustice how many people know sometimes the gloves come off and a bit of carnality happens i remember banging my thumb doing some plumbing oh my gosh i was swearing like a plumber Whew. i was like whoa where'd that come from my flesh and don't think you got it in you you know oh no i'm too holy for that pastor i would never do that yeah let me give you a plumber's sledge and all wacky and I'll see your beautiful countenance then. No, I'm telling you, we could be all be fleshy. Would you agree with me? Turn the verse inside you and say, he's talking to you right now. <laughs> says, not to me. It's, I'm not, ju yeah. oh, judge not. Oh, he's talking to me right now. Respond to others with, un respond on fairness with love. And uh, this scripture in Matthew 5 is incredible. So when people hurt you, they expect you to retaliate. They expect you to seek revenge. But God wants you to do the exact opposite. That's his word. He wants you to respond in love. Hallelujah. If you respond to mistreatment with love, you'll keep the other person from controlling you. The, the longer I held... I don't even know where that bat went. Did you just throw it in the garbage, honey? I think you did, huh? Okay. I don't, you, okay. I don't know where that bat went. I'm just thinking about now. Anyways, that bat has disappeared. Jesus, an angel came. And removed the bat from my car. I, I have no idea where it went. 
Um, but it was controlling me. My anger, my upset was controlling me. And you can't control when another person treats you unfairly, but you can't control whether you get bitter in the process or not, where you choose to trust Jesus with all that raging emotion where you're being treated unfairly and you're like, Jesus, take the wheel. I can't handle this any longer. I'm out of control. Je ne peux control. I can't do this. Jesus, take control. And you can control your response to injustice because it was literally injustice that was happening and Jesus needed to take control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control where you say, Jesus, I give you control of my life. Just because you respond to an, an offender lovingly, let me also say this, doesn't mean you continue to allow injustice. On contrary, you must lovingly seek justice in all circumstances. We must actually be workers of justice in the world without retaliating. And I remember when a fella came to me and he confessed his sin to me after being caught. Hello. I'm, I'm not sure that's a confession. I think it's more of an admission. When somebody catches you and then you confess. And so this person was, wow, up there on the line of me, don't like these kind of people. And I remember I had to actually walk with him through the process. I, I felt like punching him in the nose, and I felt like being, you know, very, I, this was a terrible situation, and he had hurt somebody, a young person, grievously. But I had, to, I had to take him to Woodstock Police Station and watch him get booked on charges, walk them through. I was the youth pastor of this, of this church, and this person did something to a young person in this church, and I had to walk through the process of justice. Even though, right, circumstance in that situation, like, oh, what do you do? What do you do? Justice is God's call. But Jeremiah 22, verse 3, as we're working towards justice, watch this. Be fair-minded and just. It's not just revengeful, not just going to make it right. Be fair-minded and just. Do what is right. And Lot, listen to me, church. We have to do what is right no matter what. This is the call. We have to do what is right at tax time. Oh, now he's really stepping on toes. We have to do what is right to our neighbor. We have to do what is right in our families. We have to be fair-minded and just together. Isn't that a tremendous scripture? Dr. Martin Luther King, you've heard of... Uh, Obviously, was a great example of this. He fought against injustice without violence. He overcame evil through the power of love. Can I tell you uh, what a testimony of overcoming evil with love? He followed the example of Jesus who chose to forgive his persecutors even as they were killing him. Jesus who chose to forgive Judas for betraying him, chose to forgive Peter for denying him. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. What a testimony, example of great love for us. And that's our call as, as followers of Jesus, as we are loving one another. And unfairness and injustice is part of the human condition, and nobody can escape it in this life. But we must not feed into it. Instead, God calls us to respond in love. James chapter 2, verse 8, so incredible. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, and I think that was on Facebook, Bethany's Facebook today, so whoever found that scripture. This is exactly right. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. So back in Jeremiah, do what is right. James is saying, if you keep the royal law found in scripture, the command of scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. This is not an option. Say, eh, if you want to love them, Jesus it said, this is a new, remember what Sonia read? A new commandment. So, it's not like on a list of maybe, maybe I'll follow Jesus in there. No, it's a commandment. So love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Remember in the garden, the serpent did not tempt Adam and Eve to steal or kill or commit adultery. He tempted them to question what God had said, to question God's word. I've just read you God's word, and if you question if we should fulfill that or not, then what's happening is you're being tempted by the serpent to do what Adam and Eve did and deny the word of the Lord. 
that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you were doing right. I'm going to read John 13, 34 and 35, what we read earlier. I'm going to read it from the New King James. By the ways, you're going to see this Scripture. Is Catherine in church today? I don't know if Catherine's in church today. She's around here somewhere. Up in the balcony. Hey, Catherine. We're close, right? We're close. It got delivered this week, so we're going to put something in the lobby that is going to be a testimony of the kind of church we want to be. It's going to be, it's going to cast vision based, based on this scripture that I read. Are you ready for it? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Loving our neighbors, loving the other, loving our enemies, love for one another. I can't wait till that goes on the screen or on the, on the wall in the, in the lobby. I'm going to take a selfie with it. I am. I'm that excited about it. Because I believe that if we can live by this commandment at Bethany, we will revolutionize the type of church we are into all that God wants us to be. In fact, we will be known as the church if we fulfill and walk into this commandment the kind of church that God wants us to be in 2022. That would be known a few weeks ago, I said, could you imagine everybody thinks Bethany's the kindest church there is? Wow, I like that church. They're so kind. Remember when I said that? Well, that goes back to this. What if people said, Bethany, they're the most loving people I know. And by the way, is it Cheryl's uh, funeral service yesterday? That, uh, that was evidence that Bethany, you know how to love people well. Come on, it's in your DNA. We're just going to resurrect it in Jesus' name to be the people that God's called us to be, to love others well. And I will say this, becoming a Christian is far less about making a decision for Christ, and it's more about surrendering our decisions to Christ. Again, if you, re if you keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. We're going to do right, church. We're going to follow the royal law found in Scripture. It's awesome to love your neighbor as yourself. It's such a simple command, but how many people know it takes everything? Yet most C Canadian Christians don't even know their neighbor's names. Oh, you want us to know our neighbor's names? Uh, that's a good start. So on the left of you, the right of you, behind you, in front of you, we'll just pick four neighbors. Who's across the street from you? Who lives beside you and who's behind you? Now, if you're in an apartment building, maybe behind you might be a tough one to figure out. So that's your assignment, your homework. First, first week into this, love your neighbor here. Second week into this, love your neighbor here, is write it down, find my neighbor's names. If you don't know them already, we're going to love our neighbors. Did you know that God enjoys watching the people he created have fellowship with each other? In Zechariah 3, verse 10, it says, Each of you will invite your neighbor to come and enjoy peace and security, surrounded by your vineyards and fig trees. This is a messianic prophecy about the kingdom of God coming. So you probably don't have a fig tree in your backyard or vineyard. It's not like having a really nice place for people to hang around, okay, to invite people in. But you will invite your neighbor to come and enjoy relationship with you in the kingdom. That's really what the scripture is about. You probably don't have those vineyards. If you did, and you got a vineyard and fig trees in back, invite me. I want to hang out with you. That would be amazing. But that, that's not the point. But the choice to be friendly and to get to know your neighbors is the beginning. This is a unique time of opportunities. COVID is, restrictions are dropping. Hallelujah. We're getting to know people around us. Glory to God. Nicer weather's coming. Everybody, come on, we need to be praising him. It's coming. I don't care. It's winter up there today. It's supposed to be March break. What's going on? But when it was really nice the other day, I saw people exercising, walking their cats even, not just their dogs. Like, everybody's outside. When we put our chairs on the front porch, we're just going to be the crazy neighbors. Hey! Hello! 
We're just going to, we maybe one day our friendly gesture will invite a real conversation, spiritual conversation. Come on, church, let's get our hands out and start waving. Let's get our hellos out and start hello. And let's get our, I love you, brother. Come on, sister. Come on, church. We're going to be that kind of people. What? Are we going to be the noisy bunch? Yes, of course. That's who we're going to be. I'm not so sure I like that. That's okay. You'll get used to it. Wait till you get to heaven. Heaven's going to be noisy. The angels, holy, holy, holy. Like it's going to be a lot of noise. Let's start practicing for heaven. Glory to God. Tell our neighbors, hey, love you. Bless. Our neighbor's already inviting us. He's in the winter. He's, he's a crazy barbecuer on the one side. Like he's smoking all kinds of things on the barbecue. Uh, the smoking thing was weird, right? Uh, he's making things on the barbecue. He's already invited us over for sausages. But it was minus 20. And I went, oh, I'm not so sure today's the day for that. But we're going to be there. I pray you connect. It might seem counterintuitive because we've been two years of isolation, right? It's going to be a bit of a trauma to get over the fear of getting to know people and getting close to people. So, right, it was good that we practiced six feet distance. It's better six feet distance than six feet under. That's my rule. And so I was glad with that. But now that that's gone, let's hug and embrace and love. All right. Point number four, and I'll end with this. How much do you love your neighbor? This might be the toughest part. Oh, man, I thought the first three were tough. We learned that the Bible is very clear about what matters in life. Galatians 5 or 6 says it this way. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, all that matters is your faith that makes you love others. Isn't that a great translation? If you don't live a life of love, then nothing you say will matter. Nothing you know will matter. And nothing you believe will matter. In fact... Listen, the people in the world today, their neighbors, co-workers, store clerks, the barista, wh you know, whoever, uh, who do not yet know Jesus care very little about what you believe. But if you're the rude person, they're going to judge. They're going to say, uh, no thanks. I heard it said that, the, that some people work in certain stores and they know by name the people that they, they don't want to serve. And they look busy doing other things. How many people know that should never be the testimony of a Christian? But how we live and conduct ourselves speaks volumes to our true beliefs and our character, and that is the measure that many will use to determine whether they will consider Jesus or not, whether Jesus is deserving of their consideration. Get ready for this. Speaking of consideration, let us be considerate of one another. You see somebody volunteering in the cold weather, Today in the parking lot with music playing like it was like 4th of July, Canada Day celebration. Like, come on now. If you just walk by and, oh, man, what are you doing? You're crazy. What are you going to Judy? What are you doing with that loud music? Where's Judy? Judy in the house right now. Judy, you made my day. I walked. There you are. Judy, you have music playing in the church parking lot in a freezing cold day. And I wasn't even expecting that. How do people know my smile was real? Judy. Thank you. Let's be considerate of one another. You know, if there's somebody in this church that's serving, they're, they're serving in an area, they're greeting, they're at the tables, they're at the booth, they're, they're in, the, in the bookstore, the, the library. I haven't even been in there, have I? Have I been in the library? Who's, who said no? The librarian, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive me. But come on, can we be the most considerate to one another? Let's practice being... I would never want to hear people being rude to one another in this church. Come on, Abe. Would that be a good thing? I don't want people being rude to you too, bud. Nobody's going to be rude. Elaine, if somebody's rude to you, will you tell me? You will. Okay. All right. Cat's out of the bag. If anybody's rude to you from this house, you tell the pastor. Okay, everybody just go, yes, pastor. Because I, I don't want us to be rude and inconsiderate to one another. We need to be the kindest to each other. Because the world will come in here, and they'll see that if we're rude to one another, who wants to be a part of that? Come on, church. I'm preaching good today. Yes, you are, pastor. Very good. All right. <laughs> let us be gentle with each other, kind with one another, considerate one another. And finally, let's live a life of love with those that we already like. True? Last scripture, maybe. 
1 Corinthians 13, 3. No matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. You can rack up an incredible amount of achievements in this life. You can have enormous accomplishments, incredible great success in your field of endeavor. The Bible says it isn't worth anything if you don't have love. It's a clanging symbol. The Bible says, God says, relationships are more important than accomplishments. Life is about relationships. And we're going to be the most loving people on the planet in Jesus' name. So, one day you're going to die. And you're going to stand before God. And God's going to say, can I see your resume? No. Can I see the trophy you won? In? No. He's not going to evaluate our lives on our bank account. Can I see that bank statement? Your T4? He, he, none of that matters. On the earth, it's stuff. But in heaven, how people know? You're showing up with who you brought. It's the people. And God's going to evaluate your life based on your relationships. How did you love me and how did you love others? I'll tell you, that's what he, he's going to ask. Did you love others well? So, you ready for this? I'm closing with this thought. I am. How well do you love? How much do you love your neighbor was the point number four. So let me ask you this. And I'll go slow. Because I don't want you to miss what I'm trying to say. Do you love God with all your heart? And do you love your neighbor? Do you love your Catholic neighbor? Do you love your Baptist neighbor? Do you love your angry neighbor? Some of you are even thinking about who that is. Do you love your crusty neighbor? Hmm. Do you love your indigenous neighbor? Do you love your black neighbor? Do you love your Muslim neighbor? Do you love your gay neighbor? Do you love your atheist neighbor? See, God never tells us to love sinners. He never says, love sinners. Never once did Jesus say, love sinners. Because it doesn't matter. He said, love your neighbors. Catholic, Baptist, gay, black, come on. He's not looking to label anybody, and neither should we. So do you love your neighbor? Father, I thank you for your word. Father, we remember that you love us. We love you. And Jesus, you are Lord. Amen. I don't want you, I'd like you to watch this song. It's called I Speak Jesus. I think it'd be great if we sing it as a church down the road. Not sure when, but it's such a powerful song. And it talks about how we need to bring Jesus to the world that we live in to overcome our anger and our fears and our worries. We just need to speak Jesus. I pray that you sing along with this song, even if you might not know it, the words will be on the screen. And uh, let this song bless you and encourage you.